just like Singapore was uh, in the 1960s, was shattered. Now over half of the population live in cities. Household income grew along with China's GDP over the years. Now people have more to spare. Needless to say how this huge increase of national wealth has lifted millions of people from poverty, reshaped the lot of the young, and boosted the confidence of the people. Yeah, for some people, these pictures must be very familiar. And this is where China is today. Pictures are taken from Beijing. So. Such extraordinary development also allured a lot of organizations to issue reports uh, very positive about China's future. People are talking about China overtaking the US as the world's number one economy in the coming decades. China is expected to rise as a superpower in the next 20 to 30 years. It is likely to pose a great threat to the US acting as the number one challenger of the US supremacy. At least that's what the uh, last NSS and NDS report of the US said. Such rhetorics also put China in the spotlight by emphasizing the sheer size of the China's economy, judging from what it looks today. However, I don't think this is the correct way to postulate what might happen within a few decades. If history does teach us anything, we should be able to see that China has never quite met people's expectations ever since the fall of the last emperor a century ago. So a very quick review of China's development since the CCP took power. In the founding era, uh, everything was in ruin after the war, but people had hope because a new republic was established and people thought, finally, we could have something to look forward to. However, right after the, the uh, 1949, nationalization of private business uh, was, was ushered in. The decade after, uh, People's Commune, uh, which sounds very fancy and very good, but actually that led to three years of disaster. Uh, as a result, 30 million people died in Mao's Great Famine. A decade after that, the Cultural Revolution, which Mao Zedong thought would usher in a, uh, a more purified society. However, that was 10 years of chaos and backwardness. Finally, in 1978, reform and opening up began. But what we have seen uh, ever since is a pattern of two steps forward, one step back in the re in, uh, regarding reforms. China will rise, obviously. There has never been any other country in the world that has lifted so many from poverty. The pure size of the consumer market is larger than you could ever imagine. The potential of economic growth unleashed by an ongoing urbanization process uh, is beyond comparison. And the tremendous investment in infrastructure shows the country's thirst to catch up with the developed countries. However, many social issues still stand, environmental problems and most importantly, human rights issues. Since I take uh, people's economic freedom as a basic human right, they are showing another side of China, another image. With that in mind, I would like to offer a quick review of economic theories that claim to illustrate the reasons for China's achievements in the past four decades. These are the theories that we normally talk about in, in China to be frank, uh, the people that I know of don't talk about the, the Confucianism as an explanation of China's uh, success. Here's Professor Ronald Coase. He came up with the uh, top, top down design and marginal revolution theory. And Professor Williamson, the transac transaction cost theory. Professor Norris, institutional change. And this is my favorite, Professor Chang's theory of county level competition, which treats county level governments as enterprises. I'm beginning to wonder perhaps that's also why the Chinese government has sent so many uh, of its county governors and city mayors to Singapore to learn from the great teachings of your former prime minister. And this is our, uh, the theory of our current uh, deputy prime minister, Premier, Mr. Liu He, uh, culture as, a, as uh, the power of culture and conventions, featuring high savings, uh, low consumption, order, diligence, and efficiency. 
which explains China's miracle. However, going through all these theories, one thing is in common, but it remains unseen. That is the theory of liberty. All the reforms China has ever taken that prove to have a positive effect on growth are reforms that encourage more liberty for the people. And if liberty knows any enemy in China, I believe that is Confucianism. Allow me to elaborate. So I shall remind you that the commencement of China's modernization uh, began in the denounce with denouncement of Confucianism. The May 4th movement, Wu Si Yun Dong, Wu Sai Guo Yun Dong, that welcomed Western concepts less democracy and science took the fight against the old culture that was based by the, uh, on, the, on Confucianism. And, well, throughout history, whenever Chinese political leaders aim to unleash the rebellious spirit of the people, or to emancipate individual heroism, or to, to liberalize the society for more progressiveness, Confucianism is the first to go. So, is there really such a thing as Confucian capitalism, or perhaps it is more with Chinese characteristics? When people talk about a Confucian capitalism uh, that brought about Asia's economic success, I think at least for China it's not the case. For example, we constantly hear words like Christian capitalism, Confucian capitalism, crony capitalism, state capitalism, or red capitalism. From a historical point of view, I think it makes a lot of sense to find relevance between the origin and the outcome of a certain combination of social, economic, political, or religional factors. But I think overstating such factors is likely to cloud our understanding of the core of capitalism, a, an unhelpful distraction, you might say. So what is capitalism? A definition, it, by definition, it is an economic system that's based on private property rights, voluntary exchange, capital accumulation, wage labor, a price system, and competitive markets. These attributes go hand in hand. When you look at capitalism from the lens of Christianity, Puritan ethics, Confucian values, or personal relationship-based networks, or centralized power, you get misled by the fact that the root cause of prosperity is not what comes before the word capitalism, but capitalism itself. I'll offer you one quick example. This is the picture of uh, uh, painted uh, dates back to uh, 900 years ago in Song Dynasty. Song Dynasty, Song Chao, Song Dynasty the, was the most capitalistic society in China's history. It was also an empire that advocated Confucianism the best, the most. However, Song Dynasty's prosperity was due to its lax control over people's freedom instead of its promotion of Confucian va values. On the other hand, many other dynasties advocated Confucianism, Confucianism, including the Ming Dynasty. But these other dynasties in China have never uh, been uh, has, has never been able to be so capitalistic or prosperous. Since we're talking about cap uh, Confucianism, and since Li Kuan Yao singled out culture as a key for prosperity with Asian characteristics, I might as well say China as the origin of Confucianism, has always been a society that largely underpinned by Confucian values. Li's interpretation, judging from his interviews, is very partial from the whole package of the Confucian values and full of contradictions, I'm sorry. Confucianism advocates duty before pleasure, loyalty to your superiors, a hierarchical system, personal virtues, and most importantly, state before individual. These core factors of Confucianism are demonstrated in many forms, such as a culture of obedience, paternalism, order, collective goods before personal freedom and welfare, and also ruling class or family state. I believe that's something you don't have here. <laughs> so, well, the whole world took notice of our President Xi Jinping when he scrapped the term limit. So, yeah, you don't have that nonsense here, too. And Confucianism's influence is interwoven in, into the cultural DNA of the Chinese people and to some extent the other Asian peoples. Uh, here's a picture of the wisdom and, mor and, and moral principles laid out by Confucius really are a blessing for the Chinese civilization. His teachings tell people to be benign, to be upright, courteous, temperate, and complacent in life. That's very good values, that's very good principles to live by for a person 
to be a junzi or a gentleman. However, when such moral values are applied in the public arena, using them to bind people together into a certain order, a hierarchical society emerges, giving rise to a bureaucratic system on which Li Guangyao actually commented very wisely that such a culture would hold China back from its catch-up journey. And yeah, some, of, uh, some, some from the audience might be able to read this. Uh, the word mu, it means to govern, to rule, or to shepherd. It, it is also the title of uh, a government official in ancient Chinese uh, society. So would you rather, I mean, in the ancient Chinese culture, which, is, which was quite Confucian, would you rather uh, live in a country where you are treated like animals? Because the government treat you that way. To be fair, order and stability are important for a country in the catch-up journey of development. China did not take off just when there were a lot of domestic revolts or chaos. As Li Guangya also admitted, when an, uh, when an economy has already taken off, there are other factors that are more important than keeping people in line, such as innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, free trade, or more openness and integration into the global market. Right now in, in China, we're uh, faced with the Confucian curse. The challenges China is faced with right now is a perfect demonstration of why Confucian order will lead to sclerosis. We have uh, half of the economy made up of state-owned state -owned enterprises. Uh, things might, uh, uh, it's a different picture here, I guess. Uh, the Chinese SOEs form the interest groups that are now struggling to survive at the expense of the interest of the Chinese people. Uh, American sociologist Master Olson uh, argues that national decline is caused most fundamentally by sclerosis. The rigidity of interest groups of firms, laborers, capital, and the state. So as you can see, these companies in the black boxes, they are Chinese companies, all of which are state-owned enterprises. They made to the top 100 in the Fortune 500 companies last year. In China's case, when you put what we have regarding the SOEs in the light of the escalating trade war with the US, what we can see is not the Chinese government standing for the interest of the whole Chinese citizens, but acting as the agent of the interest groups. To be specific, these interest groups are, the, are made of government officials, uh, the state-owned enterprises, and their minions in the private sector. If you take a look at the U.S. acquisition and the Chinese, uh, of the Chinese government, you will easily find that these areas are um, heavily dominated by the SOEs and, inter and, and vested interests, including energy, telecommunication, infrastructure, banking, insurance, and others. So these requests are put out by the US government. I made a, a summary. Um, in short, can I have fair trade, no government subsidies to exporting enterprises, free flow of internet data, or further opening of the Chinese market? As you can see, if you have been following the China-US trade war recently, um, it's a clear answer, no. So if China's success cannot be attributed to Confucian capitalism, then why should Asian values sell? Apparently the success of Singapore is constantly used to justify the Asian values. For those who are from Western countries or under 50, I, I just want to shout out that living in an authoritarian country is not fun. Uh, and <laughs> since we have already an elegant lady, uh, Lee Schooland in the room, she might be able to share with you some of her stories, and you will, you will see. For most time of the history, China has been a rule-based society, a society that stresses order instead of liberty, obedience instead of standing up to power, group mentality instead of originality, coercion instead of voluntary exchange. Here I'd like to quote something said by uh, Dr. David Bowes. He said, we want a free society where coercion is kept at a necessary minimum. Maybe in some people's eyes, people like me are, are clouded by a fantasy uh, of liberal, uh, classical liberalism, 
but the same argument goes for them too. They're blinded either unknowingly, which is an innocent banality of evil, or deliberately, which is a crime against humanity, by a false logic of power politics, identity politics, economic unfreedom, and rule of man. What I believe regarding the path to prosperity in the future is the principles of liberty and individual rights. These principles are originated in the West, but it doesn't make them Western values. They are universal, just as uh, the principles of science are universal, even though most of the scientific discoveries are made in the West. So totalitarianism or authoritarianism is the surface, but not the cause of prosperity. The root cause of prosperity of four decades of economic growth and the improvement of Chinese people's livelihood is liberty. And again, I like to stress that Asian values are not Asian, but values that are used to justify strongman politics. Western values are not Western, but natural rights that underpins a modern free society. I was also asked to talk a little bit about um, the future of the world, which is a huge topic, and also the threat of what are faced with. So what I see as the biggest challenge of the world today is not surging populism or the unbalanced development of globalization or the trade war or terrorism or refugee crises or, or uh, Trump. No, what I see as the biggest challenge of the world today is the, is the unremitting self-reflection of classical liberals who began to question whether they have been on the right side, whether their philosophy has gone obsolete or whether they should be the one whose thoughts should be reformed, uh, uh, It's a very popular thing that the Chinese scholars are doing right now, to question themselves in, uh, in front of power. While there are people who assert in words and action the dominance of totalitarianism, socialism, communism, even personal cult, the response from a true classical liberal is not, well, maybe some of them are making a little sense or perhaps we are just coming in too strong. No, what we should think is we are not going to apologize for minor errors while making a compelling argument against the repeatedly proven falsehood of a philosophies that some dead German scholars. So the, <laughs> I, I personally don't think the Asian values are equivalent to Confucianism. As I see, the, and judging from what Li Guangyao illustrated in his words, the bedrock of Singapore's success or the root cause of Li Guangyao's achievements lies in his pragmatism. In his lifetime, he studies socialism from Larsky in England, right? Only to find that a third way, an alternative other than capitalism or socialism was possible. He also studied Mao Zedong's works and learned about strategies and tactics. He hated Leninism because, because of all the evils he, unleashes, he unleashed. He was anti-communism his whole life, but he was revered as a respectful elderly by the Chinese President Xi Jinping. So if you ask me, what is Li Guangyao's life philosophy that brought, the, that brought about the Asian, uh, uh, the, the Asian miracle? I would say pragmatism, and unfortunately pragmatism is not a core teaching of Confucianism. Confucius teaches us that to put your honor uh, to put your principles before your life or to, to sacrifice your life for your principles. He didn't teach people to have second thoughts when it comes to principles, loyalty to, to the emperors or honesty, which are basically personal virtues. I'm not here to master a vivid section of the Singaporean economy and its development model. You guys know better coming from a country that is more free than China. So what is the way ahead? I believe it's liberty, the backbone of a modern free society. And with that, I bid you good luck.